look that up. Why don't we stand together, open up to John, the 14th chapter, unless you are following on the PowerPoint. John, the 14th chapter, a very familiar portion of Scripture. Verses 1 to 6. God knows all about our grief, our stress, our apprehension, and uh, we don't even have to voice it verbally. He knows our heart. He knows our mind, and he addresses things, especially through his word. Verse 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, famous verse, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Father, we need to hear from heaven today. We need your power and your encouragement. Thank you for your mercy. We lift up our country. We lift up our world. We lift up those who are sick. But, Father, we do pray for people that are spiritually sick and do not know you. They know of you. They have an intellectual understanding, but they don't know you personally. You tell us in, our, in your word that the demons also believe and tremble, but it's doing them no good. We need a supernatural heart transplant. People need to be born again. And Father, as a pastor who preaches the gospel, and any church that preaches the gospel, our greatest fear is people standing in the congregation who know of you, but they don't truly know you. Bless every word spoken today. Might it not be my words, but might it be yours. Bless your people. Protect your people. We ask it. In Christ's name and for his sake, amen. You can be seated, friends. We have started a new sermon series entitled In Pursuit of Jesus, and it will be five messages that lead right up to Easter. Maybe you've seen one of these laying around. Um, there are still plenty of them laying around. Uh, if you have your heart broken for somebody, give them this. Invite them out to church. The final message will be on Easter Sunday, and we would like to see as many people come to hear the gospel as possible. We serve a risen Savior. He has power over the grave. He has authority and uh, all power has been given to him. And he says to us, because of that, go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. As I've already stated in my opening remarks, the world has been brought to its knees. Does it know it? Does it acknowledge that God did that? Well, maybe for some who have been witness to and are considering the things of Christ. But so amazing not to see any sports, to have the NCAA canceled, March Madness canceled, entertainment canceled. And I have determined that I am not going to be glued to Fox News 24 7 seeing from minute to minute if things have changed. I think I would do better to read my Bible and get close to the Lord and whatever I need to hear, I'm sure one way or another I will hear it. This is our time to shine as believers. Matthew 5, 16 says your light, let your light so shine before men 
that others may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. What you believe will dictate what you do. And I happen to believe that with all my heart. Some of you who um, remember Paul Harvey, great newscaster, commentator, Paul Harvey used to do a little spiel that he'd say, and now the rest of the story, if you remember that. Paul Harvey tells a true story about a woman who lost her husband, and she went down to the hospital, actually to the department that takes in obituaries, with a four-page glowing report of her husband that had just passed away. They told her from behind the counter that they were concerned about her because they charged 50 cents a word. And she had four pages that she had turned in. Very quickly, she said, oh my, and she took the four pages back from the woman behind the counter, and she wrote something down. She said, post this. What it said on that piece of paper was, Sam Brown dies. The woman looked at her from behind the counter, and she said, we have a seven-word minimum. So she reached out. She took the piece of paper back, and she wrote some things down. She says, here you go. The woman behind the counter read the ad. This time it read, Sam Brown dies, 88 Ford for sale. We all deal with Grief, complications, how the world responds to things differently. And the word of God is no different. We see people grieving in the word of God. We see Jesus grieving in the word of God for the state of his creation and the state of his believers. Grieving and responding to it can be a complicated process and we all have to grieve sometimes we need to learn when there is a time to end grieving and step into the joy which God supplies but we're all different and you will know when that time is when you go through a grieving process but I'm here to declare to you that Jesus understands he understands every human emotion and he cares about that. Jesus taught and he gave forth the means for overcoming grief in our life. And we have all grieved, haven't we? And we will grieve in the future. And we all deal with grief in a different way. Jesus always seemed to be about his creation, about the human beings that he created and how they reacted to things. The text that we read this morning, John 14, they didn't verbalize anything. Jesus was talking about going away, going to the cross, being sacrificed. They didn't understand all that. They thought he was going to be an earthly leader and set up his throne in Israel, and Roman suppression would be stamped out. He knew that they didn't understand, especially when Thomas said, where are you going? And how can we know the way? That might have been our question if we had been there. Even though they didn't verbalize, Jesus looked at them and he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He says, I'm going now to prepare a place for you. Amen? and the place you know, and the way you know. And again, Thomas wasn't quite sure what Jesus was saying, but he ultimately said, how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way. The truth and the life, no man comes to the Father but by me. I don't care if you're lost or a Christian, he is still the way. He is the truth and the life. And he is the one that we are to receive our comfort and mercy and marching orders from. 
if we're going to make it through a very difficult, difficult world. Jesus entered our dark, sin-cursed world to bring freedom, to bring life, to give us eternal perspective and understanding. His resurrection, his final act that we will be talking about, proves that he had the power and the authority to say what he says throughout his word to do such things. I want to know what Jesus said. I want to know what his word says. I want to find my answers from the word of God. The sermon title today is Grief Overturned. Only Jesus can overturn our grief once and for all for all eternity. So we're going to notice just a couple of things today that I think will help us in looking at our grief being overturned, take us through difficult times like today, cause us to have answers and power, help us to be decisive in how we look around us and see others who do not know the Lord, and help us to function and be a light for those who are lost. So the first thing this morning, notice what grieved Jesus. Now I'm going to lay a tall order on you. I'd like you to memorize this verse, John 11:35. Jesus wept. That's it. Can we all do that? Say it with me. Jesus wept. That's pretty easy. But you know what? That shows me that he understands every human emotion that he understands when we're hurting. He wept as we notice the raising of Lazarus this morning. He states the shortest verse in Scripture. Now, you know the story, but I'm going to briefly review it with you once again. Jesus, I don't know how, uh, they didn't have the technology we have today, but Jesus received word that Lazarus of Bethany, the brother of Mary and Martha, was sick, very sick. And they called for Jesus to come. They were able to trust him with physical issues. And they wanted him to come. They knew he could heal Lazarus. But Jesus purposely detained his departure in going to see Lazarus. After about four days passed, Jesus said, we can go now. We can go visit Lazarus because he sleeps. The disciples didn't know what they meant. The disciples said, well, it's good that he's sleeping. People get better when they get plenty of rest. Jesus then said plainly, Lazarus is dead. And they went, oh, we can now go. When he arrived on the scene, he had people that he loved run up to him and say, Lord, if you had been here, my brother did not need to die. Jesus looked at them and he said, your brother will rise again. Martha, who is extremely spiritual, she said, oh, I know he'll be raised up on the last day at the resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus looked around. The professional mourners were there. They paid people to cry and weep. They did it so well. It was the emotional folks. I would have been one of them. I would have made some good money in that day. They were weeping. They were crying. And as Jesus looked around and saw all the pain and the sorrow, John 11.35 says that he wept. He got brought to the tomb where Lazarus had been buried. And the amazing thing that I've talked about before, but maybe not in too much detail, they embalmed thoroughly. He was wrapped time and time again with rags around him. From his ankles up to the top of his head, spices he was anointed with, rags stuffed down his throat. 
And when Jesus came to the tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth, and I'm speculating here. So don't anybody leave saying that I'm adding to Scripture. As I thought more this week about Lazarus being wrapped so tight with those grave clothes, with those rags, so tight, a napkin over his face, I doubt very seriously that when the Son of God said, Lazarus, come forth, I don't even think he could have hopped out of that grave. I don't think he could have sat up. I really don't. I picture in my mind, those of you who like science fiction, I picture in my mind him laying there and suddenly going out the opening of that tomb. Now alive, but still bound by grave clothes, and Jesus said, loose him and let him go. You know how many Christians have received Christ as Savior? They've been saved, but they're still bound by their grave clothes. They're not really free. The jail cell door has been opened, but they still wander around the jail cell, not knowing where the opening is, where the exit is. How many Christians have I met in my life like that who have no victory, no freedom? They've been saved, but they're still not free, and they need to be free. I think it's important today as we look at the story, now that Lazarus has been raised, now that we understand that Jesus wept over that, I believe Jesus grieved and he wept because of several things. I've listed a couple of them if you're taking notes. I think he viewed this last enemy, death, as a terrible, ugly mark on his creation. It was never meant to be this way. Man was never destined to die. He was created perfect. He was created for eternity. And now mankind, because of sin, needed the bridge to be gapped and it was gapped by Jesus. His death, his burial, his redemptive work, so that we could come to God. Colossians 1 says Jesus is the creator, and it was created for him. So I think he looked around at all of the remnants of death, and he just burst into tears, because it wasn't supposed to be that way. He saw remorse, confusion, even demonstrated by those he loved, Mary and Martha. He witnessed, as I already said, the professional mourners. Look at the people that come out of the woodwork when there is grief and sorrow to make a buck. I joked with Karen. I said, why didn't I have the good sense to buy stock and toilet paper? Right as this thing started, why didn't I see it? I actually left a roll of paper towels, and don't you go get it, in my back seat, actually on the floor. And as I left my car, I thought about it. Should I leave that roll of toilet paper there? A couple days ago, that toilet paper, a roll of toilet paper and paper toweling was laying back there, and on the other side was my laptop that I left in the car. And I thought to myself, I bet they leave the laptop and they grab the toilet paper and the paper towel. I was going to put a note on the church bathroom walls, you know, shoplifters will be persecuted or prosecuted and persecuted. I think we should have a camera in there to watch to see who's stuffing rolls of toilet paper underneath their shirt. You know, so we will, there is a scanner when you leave today, and uh, we will check that out. Jesus' heart broke, even though people had limited understanding. They didn't realize they were dealing with the resurrection and the life. John 11 in verse 45 gives us some clear understanding of the most important reason why this was happening. 
It says, Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed in him. So there was the greatest result of him allowing Lazarus to die, to be raised from the dead, to work a miracle. It was so that people would believe in him. Could that be the situation today with what's going on in our world? That God has allowed this so that people would believe in him? That there be an opportunity for you and I to shine and to be salt and light and lead people to a saving knowledge of Christ. Albert Barnes, a great commentator, said, a more striking proof of the divine mission and power of Jesus. Are you waiting for some answers to prayer? And Jesus is saying, not yet. We're gonna, I'm going to stay right where I am for now, and I'm going to allow certain things to happen. Do you trust in his plan? Do you trust for him to have your grief overturned? Other things that grieved him, remember when John the Baptist was beheaded? He heard about that in Matthew 14, 13. That grieved him. Remember when Jesus in Matthew 23 wept over Jerusalem? His chosen people? And he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, those of you who kill the prophets, how often I desire to gather you to me like a mother hen would gather her chicks, but you would not. It breaks God's heart when we grieve and when we don't understand the answer, when we can't clearly see the hand of God in our lives, it breaks his heart. So much grieved our Savior. Secondly, grief empowers us for ministering. Hebrews 4 and verse 15. I know you have it on the New King James on the screen. Uh, I've memorized it in the Old King James years ago. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He's familiar with my infirmities. He's familiar with my grief and my sorrow and my pain and my lack of understanding. He loves you. He loves you to the end, and he wants us to understand his will for our life. What sorrow? What grief? have you already endured without Jesus, without acknowledging him? What are you going through right now? What might you be going through tomorrow? And you will need to learn about the God of all comfort. I want you to read something with me if you brought a Bible or an electronic device that you'd like to look this up. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. I want to read this with you, 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. And if you're flipping, I'll wait till you get there. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all, our tribulation. Why? That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. There is a purpose for grief. There is a purpose for sorrow. There is a purpose for people and their lack of understanding concerning spiritual things. That's why we're told to study, to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When you stand in those little get-togethers at work or at the market or at the gas station and people say, what in the world is going on? 
do you answer? Do you give them hope? Do you let them know there is a God of comfort who is using their pain and their grief to draw them to himself? How many times in my own life I know I didn't appreciate the grief and the pain, but I knew if I trusted God when I came through on the other side, life would be sweet. And I will have grown in wisdom and in knowledge and understanding of what God wants to do in my life. I wrote down some things about grief. Again, if you're taking notes, we get silent sometimes when we grieve, right? We don't know what to say. Some of you hibernate. You put your answering machine on. You scan your phone calls on your iPhone very carefully. And you're quiet. You don't want to talk to anybody. I went through a rough time in my life, and I had a pastor friend who called me several times a week for about a month. He'd say, I know you're there. I know you're hibernating. I know you're upset. Give me a call. What's going on? But finally, I called him. And isn't it funny? He was offering me a job. But I ignored him for about a month. Sure, I'm glad that he kept after me and brought me at that point in time back to New Jersey. That was very interesting. Grief silence is holy and healing. Remember Romans 8, 26? He's familiar with the Holy Spirit with our infirmities. We don't even know how to pray when we have grief and sorrow. We just get quiet or we babble or we try to control things ourselves. The Spirit of God will help you center in on the right thing. Even Job's friends, when they came in Job 2, verses 11 to 13, they sat down for seven days in the dust with Job. They didn't even recognize him from afar. And they were quiet. You ever have to do that with somebody or with yourself? You just want people to be quiet. You appreciate they're there, that they care. But there's nothing they can say. There's nothing they can do. No one cares for you like Jesus. He is the one who will overturn your grief. Grief brings dependency. I got to lean on God. There's nothing else I can do. I'm not in control. Grief teaches us that we are not in control and we don't know what to do. And even if we did know what to do, we wouldn't be able to pull it off. Grief refocuses our attention from the thing that's grieving us to the right or left or behind or in front to looking up and focusing on God. Why don't we do that even though we know it's in there somewhere? Why don't we look to God? Do we need our faith increase? Does Satan not want us to look up? Is it true when the Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin? Does God want to increase our faith and our belief in him and our dependency upon us? Grief also tells us to go. That's why missionaries go. Their heart's broken. They're grieved for foreign fields where they've never been. I remember students in Bible college showing me a map and showing me the name of a country or a city in Africa that I never heard of before. And they said, I'm going there. And I'm so excited. I remember thinking to myself, better you than me. And I'm just being honest with you. We're not going to go everywhere where missionaries go, but that's why we love supporting them. As they go down into the well, I like to hold on to the rope and lower them down into the well and let them know that they have support. How many times have I seen people grieving and it prompts me to go? How many times I've said to Karen, I, I've got to go. I've got to get over there. You know, I, I would love to turn my phone off sometimes. You know, but pastoring is 
Last night I'm laying in bed, uh, Sunday nights, just so you know, in case you just want to say, hey, what's going on? I'm laying in bed and it suddenly hits me, I ought to send out a text about the new series at 9 a.m. So I'm laying in bed and I send it out, all of a sudden I hear, five seconds later, ten seconds later, five minutes later, it happened about ten times. I never get that reaction from a group text. I turned my phone over because the light kept coming on, and I lay there with my yellow lab and uh, finally fell asleep. This morning at breakfast, our devotion time, Karen said, she was laughing. She said, do you see what went on with that group text last night? I said, no. She said, it was hysterical. People were making jokes. Somebody, Bob Burns, said, I need to send you some cheddar and cheese soup. That's what made me sick this week. I had um, food poisoning. Karen sends back a note, send them a whole pot. Other people are saying, what in the world's going on? This is a group text, I don't understand. While I hear, ah, ah, ah. I always pray that I'll answer the important one. But sometimes you know, like Don out in Chicago, I've got to go. I've got to get out there. My brother might not make it. He has been receptive to the gospel lately. And he has been. And he's hoping that he's either already received Christ or it'll be a platform for him witnessing again. Grief causes you to say, I've got to go. I've got to be there for somebody. I can't wait. I have to share the gospel. Grief tells you when to weep. Grief tells you when to laugh. I have been at funerals where people know somebody died and went to heaven, and it's like a revival service. People are sitting out there, and I'm like, God is good. Such and such is in heaven. Everybody starts waving handkerchiefs. That's something they do down south when they're excited. You know? Praise God. Singing hymns and excited. You don't get that in a crowd of unbelievers. It's quiet. And I'm not saying believers don't cry and they don't grieve and they don't miss. But there is a blessed hope that Jesus is going to overturn our grief. Grief tells us to serve and pray. He might wake you up to get out of your bed at night to pray for somebody who is grieving and going through a difficult time. Thirdly and finally this morning, Ultimately, grief causes us to pursue Jesus. And that's what I've been praying for with our church being open and why I think it is so important for us to conduct our services. Matthew 11, you're familiar with this, verse 28, says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your soul for my yoke is easy and my burden is light I must tell Jesus I must tell Jesus I cannot bear my burden alone amen Jesus will help me amen he will help us when we're grieved and why we're burdened. While Karen and I were away at that pastor-wife uh, conference down at Keswick, one of the speaker there mentioned Isaiah 9, 6 that describes Jesus, the Son of God. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And this is the part he centered in on and the government will rest upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, 
mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. But the line, the government will rest upon his shoulder. What are you carrying on your shoulder that you were never designed to carry? Jesus wants you to give it to him to carry. Have you ever been to 45 Rockefeller Plaza in New York City? There is a statue there. It's a big, muscular guy, bent over, great definition, all of his muscles, like this, with the world on his shoulder. He was given that burden by Zeus as punishment. And all Atlas could do, a mighty titan, was to just stand there and carry the load of the world on his shoulder. Is that what Jesus has called us to do? Or does he seek to overturn our grief? What is your grief today? What is your burden? What fear, what sadness do you carry? Tell it to Jesus.